my daughter, you may know her, her name is Claire, she loves blocks. You know, like building blocks, like those wooden blocks? There she is. <laughs> so my daughter loves, like, adores them. And I'm always, like, I'm always super impressed with her because when I think of blocks, I think of one direction that blocks can go. They go up. You, you, know, you put one on top of the other, go, 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 up, up, up. But Claire, I think she's special. I don't know. But <laughs> maybe it's just because I'm her dad. <laughs> but, but she just, like, she, moves, she builds them in all different directions. Like, she, she doesn't just constrain her thinking to a tower. Like, last week, she built a train. I would have ever thought you'd make a train out of blocks. It had, like, it had like eight wheels on each side. They all matched the color of the caboose in the middle. Of, yeah, she's special. Um, it had a smokestack and everything. She loves blocks so much. And she loves blocks that much, really that much, that every single morning, every morning, I'm not exaggerating, I promise you, every morning, 6, maybe if I'm lucky, 6.30 a.m., she crawls over to me in bed, and she whispers in my ear, Dad, blocks. <laughs> and I look, over, I look over at the clock, <laughs> 6.38. Oh, Claire, it's still dark outside, which thank the Lord for winter. Uh, <laughs> Claire, it's still dark. It's time for bed. And so she says, okay. And she lies back down in bed. Waits 30 seconds, and then she crawls up to my ear again and says, Dad, play blocks. Play blocks. <laughs> and I throw the covers over, and I get out of bed, because Claire runs the house. <laughs> and, and it's 6.30, so at this point, it's like, okay, I'm awake. I may as well. I may as well get ready. Um, and, you know, as she's done this, she does it every single day, over and over. I played blocks with her this morning. Um, as she's done this, I've, I've started to realize that the reason that she gets me up in the morning, even though she loves blocks, is not because of the blocks. It's not about the blocks. The reason that Claire gets me up every single morning to play with blocks is because she wants to be with me. It's because she wants to spend time with me. She wants to enjoy my presence. It's not about the blocks, as cool as they are. It's not about the blocks. And God is the same way. God feels the same way about us. And sometimes he asks us to do things, and a lot of times, it's not about that thing we're doing. It's about spending time with him. It's about coming into the presence of the Lord. It's not about the blocks. So God wants to spend time with you. And we see that throughout the entire Bible. Literally, guys, this time of my Bible study this week was so enriching to me because I was able to go through the whole Bible and see this relentless pursuit of God and trying to bring his presence to his people. He's trying to be with us. He's trying to live with us. And sometimes we think of God as like, you know, like a distant God. Like he set things in motion and then he just like took a step back and said, all right, let's see how that, how that pans out. That is not who our God is, okay? Our God desires our presence. Our God desires to be with us, to spend time with us, to just be, to just sit with us, sit at the table in communion with us. That's his desire. And I can prove it. So we're going to take a journey See how many tabs I have in my Bible? I cut these in half, okay? <laughs> I'm pro I, pr I promise you, I'm going to storm through these. So I'm not going to ask you to turn um, in your Bibles if you brought one. Just follow along on the screens because that's just wasting time turning pages. we got to fly, okay? <laughs> All right. So the, the Israelites, God's people, we're picking up our story here. They had been enslaved to Egypt for 400 years, 430 years. They were under horrible oppression by the Egyptian people. And God frees them. God liberates them. He saves them from their oppressors. He saves them from Egypt. Casts, they, takes them out, leads them on this journey across the wilderness to the promised land. And by day, he leads them as a pillar of cloud. This giant pillar of cloud that went before them and told them, this is the way you need to go. Go this way, go this way, go this way. And then by night, it was a pillar of fire. So that's cool in and of itself. So we can just say, first point, God is cool. 
<laughs> so God led them that way through the wilderness as a pillar of cloud and a pillar, pillar of smoke. But then one day, the Lord speaks to Moses, the leader of Israel, and he says this to him, Exodus 25, verse 8, have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary, build me a tabernacle or a big tent, build me a holy sanctuary, and here's the reason, so I can live among them so I can be with them, so I can dwell with them. The reason that God wanted this, be- it was a beautiful, immaculate tabernacle, this tent built for him, was not because he wanted a pretty building. It was so that he could actually live in their midst. Because there's a difference in relationship between you're just following someone as a leader. Like, you know, we're following this pillar of, of cloud in the desert, this pillar of fire in the desert. We're just following every day, every day, he just kind of, he's there. There's a difference between someone who, like that and someone who's living on your block. He's in a tent. He's in, right in the middle of their encampment. He's tented with them. He's living with them. So the purpose of the tabernacle was to bring God's presence to the people. All the worship that went on there, that's very important too. But God's primary reason for bringing that tabernacle down was so he could be with us. God wants to be with us because he is not a distant God. He's a God of relationship. He is a God in which you are dear and near to his heart. He wants to be with us too. He wants to be with us. And it says, once the tabernacle was complete, so they finished, and actually, I love this part of the Bible because it says, Moses finished hanging the curtains. <laughs> and I just love that imagery of Moses hanging the curtains. <laughs> it was an elaborate curtain, okay? It's not like that. Uh, so as soon as, as soon as Moses finished hanging the curtains of the tabernacle, it says, the cloud of the Lord. So that giant pillar of cloud just whoosh, flooded the entire temple. God was there. His presence with, was with his people. He was there. It was tangible. Like, there was no doubt. Yeah. I am praying that today that cloud comes in here. Yeah. I want to see it. Yeah. I want to know. Because I know that God's presence is with her people, with his people. Yeah. But man, I want to see it. I want to see his face. Don't you? Yeah. Amen. All right. The presence of God dwelt with his people. Fast forward 400 years. We're skipping through. The people of Israel, they were living in tents in the wilderness. Well, 400 years later, they're no longer living in tents. They're living in an established kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. They move from tents to buildings. And they have a king. King David is over them. And King David, one day, as he's sitting in his temple, he has this thought. 2 Samuel 7, verse 1. When King David was settled in the palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, like he's living it up. He's, he's doing pretty good for himself right now. The king summoned Nathan the prophet and he said, look, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace. But the ark of God, which was a symbol for God's presence, is out in the tent I have this beautiful palace made of cedar, made of gold, with all the finishing. There's probably some marble in there. And God's out there in a tent. So he gets this idea in his mind, I am going to build a temple for the Lord to honor him, to glorify him. That's a good idea, right? That's a good idea. And so Nathan the prophet says, go and do it. I'm sure God is with you. But then something interesting happens, as it often does with our Lord, Verse 3, or verse 4, so after Nathan had said, yeah, go do it, God's, God's with you. That same night the Lord said to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I've never lived in a house. From the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day, I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle is my dwelling. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained. I've never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I've never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? And so do you see the Lord's heart here? 
David wanted to build God this beautiful, elaborate temple. Could you show the picture of that? This beautiful, elaborate temple. And he ended up doing it, and God was pleased by that. God was glorified by that. God was honored by it, and God blessed the building of the temple. This is the point when David decides to do this, when God says, I am going to bless you and your descendants forever. God loved the fact that he wanted to build this temple, but he didn't need it. He didn't need the temple because it's not about the building. It's not about the blocks. It's not about the tabernacle. It's not about the temple. The purpose of these buildings, the purpose of the temple, was to bring God's presence to his people. So it didn't matter. It didn't matter to God if he's in a canvas tent or an ornate, golden, marble built building. It just didn't matter to him. He was honored by it. And David was blessed by it, by this endeavor that he did. And his son Solomon who finished the temple, God blessed him for it too. But it wasn't necessary. It was good, but it wasn't God's main purpose. God's purpose was to bring his presence to the people. Fast forward 400 years. Imagine, it's so weird how that happens, isn't it? (laughs) 400 years later. So Israel had a slew of just bad kings over and over and over again. After King David, after King Solomon. King Solomon is iffy. Um, Even David had some issues. But through Israel's rampant sin, they started following to just ramp, falling into rampant sin. And the worst sins was they, they no longer worshipped the God of Israel, and they turned and worshipped other gods. They turned to Baal. They turned to Sheol, all these other weird gods, because they thought these gods will be our provider and not Yahweh. Yeah. Dumb, okay? They turned, to the, they turned to those other gods, and the Lord allows them to be exiled from the promised land, to be kicked out by the, by the, the nations of Assyria and the nations of Babylon. They're kicked out, and they're sent into exile. And the temple, this gem, this beautiful, this beautiful building that God, built, that God allowed to be built, he allowed it to be destroyed, too, because it wasn't about the building. The building wasn't that special. It's about God's presence with his people. So it's a pile of rubble, and then God brings, God eventually, after their time of, of disobedience, their time of punishment, is at an end. God brings his people back into the land of Israel and says, okay, now rebuild my temple. Now is the time to rebuild my temple so that I can live among you. And they don't do the great job. <laughs> if you imagine, if you broke down any building, especially a magnificent building like the temple, If you take all the pieces back and try and like put it back together again, it's not going to be as good. So it ended up kind of looking like a little bit like a ruin. Okay, it's it's a building like maybe it keeps the rain out, but it's just nowhere near the splendor that it used to hold. But then the Lord speaks to His people in Haggai. We don't read from Haggai very much, but it's a good book. Haggai chapter two, verse three. God says to this, and it's a little chilling. (laughs) Does anyone remember this house, this temple in its former splendor? How in comparison does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. It must seem like nothing at all. But now... I love these but nows. But now the Lord says, be strong, Zerubbabel. He was the governor. Be strong, Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land, and now get to work. For I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. My spirit remains among you. My spirit remains with you. Just as I promised when you came out of Egypt, so do not be afraid. This temple was destroyed and then rebuilt, and God speaks to the people, yeah, it's good that you're rebuilding the temple, but here's the deal. I was never contained by that temple. I was never restrained by that temple. I've been with you. 
I've been with you this entire time of exile. I have never left you. My spirit, my presence remains with you from now until the end of time. I will be with you. God's presence goes with his people. It is not constrained and it is not restrained by a building. This building, this church, this is a cool building. It's going to look even cooler once we're done remodeling it. But God's presence is not bound to this church. God's presence goes with his people. Because that's what he's about. He's about relationship. He's about building these ties. He's about living with us. He wants to dwell with us. Not the building. And that's a very important point. Because something really, really, really cool happens. How many years later? Actually, it's 500, but I'm glad you're paying attention. (laughs) 500 years later, gotcha. (laughs) 500 years later, we got to keep, you know, there's a lot of scripture we're going through. We got to keep it, keep keep some brevity. Um, 500 years later, the temple comes in a very different form. We see it in John chapter 1, verse 14. You probably know it, what's coming. So the word became human. The word became flesh and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And I love this word because it says in verse 14, it says he made his home among us. And that verb, made his home, means pitched his tent in the original language. He tabernacled with us. Because remember, God's purpose wasn't to build a tent, it was to live with them. And I love how that theme is continued even in the Old Testament. He pitched his tent with us. He wanted to be our neighbor. He wanted to live with us, to dwell with us. He pitched his tent. Jesus was the living embodiment of the temple. The living embodiment of the temple. Jesus was God's presence in human form, sent to dwell with us, deliver us, and demonstrate to us what it means to bring God's presence to earth. Because that's what it's all about. Bringing God's presence to the people. Jesus exemplified that as a human. It's not a building anymore. It's a person. He laid the foundation for all of us. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. This is where it gets really cool. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. You are coming to Christ. This is where it gets really relevant. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone, the foundation of his temple, of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen for God by great honor, for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. You are all living stones. You are pieces of that temple. The purpose of the temple was to bring God's presence to the people. And so God took it, no longer needed to constrain it with a building. He brought it in human form to Jesus. And then through the power of his Holy Spirit, he says, the temple no longer needs to be a single entity. No longer needs to be a single thing, one thing. It's expanded and it's exploded out into the world. The temple of God is now the church. It's all of you. You are all living stones. You are part of the temple because every single one of you, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God inhabits you and you are now a living stone, a living embodiment of God's presence to be sent out into the world to spread God's presence throughout the earth. That is our duty. That is our spiritual sacrifice. You are all living stones that form the temple. You are the church built on Jesus, a house for his presence 
and even death cannot stop you. Because we see, as we continue that passage again, verse 4 again, what's more, not only are you the temple, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Notice this is not passive. You are called to be the temple, but you are not a stationary building. You are not a building that is beautiful like the temple, but does nothing. You have an active role to play. You're not just sitting pretty, okay? Remember, when, God, when David wanted to build a pretty temple, God said, sure, that's fine, but that's not the reason. And so I think we as Christians, we get so focused on sitting pretty. We get focused on ourselves as an individual. I am an individual temple. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which it is, but we forget that we are not dead stones. We are living stones that move out and go into the world to spread God's presence to the people. You're not sitting pretty. I don't care how good of a Christian you are. I don't care how well you obey the Ten Commandments, how, how well you love your neighbor, how well you do all this great stuff, how often you come to church on Sunday. If you are not living in active faith, you're just a dead stone. You're called to be a living stone. And as that stone makes sacrifices for your king, you're a priest. You make sacrifices for him. What is a sacrifice? What, what sacrifice is good enough for a king? Romans 12. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind God will find acceptable. There are sacrifices God doesn't find acceptable. Let them being a, be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship God. This is your spiritual worship, to offer up our very lives, our very existence as a sacrifice, as an offering to the Lord, saying, Lord, here I am, send me. I will go out into the world. I will go out into my community to spread your presence to the people. I don't want to be a stationary temple that looks really good in marble, and in gold, but does nothing. You're made for more. You're made for more. And you were made to bring God's presence to the people. That's always been the purpose of the temple. Always. Since the beginning of time. That's what God has pursued, and that's what God is calling you to do. That's what he's calling you to do today. To God, that's true worship. Everything else is good, but giving up your li life, the way that Jesus gave up his life for you, that's true worship. Greater love has no man than he who would give up his life, lay down his life for his friends, to say, I'm giving up this life. I'm giving up my dream job. I'm giving up my dream spouse, not Bef bef not after you're married, okay? <laughs> I'm saying you may want to pursue someone before you're married, but God says no. That's what I said, okay? <laughs> I just had to curb that real quick. Okay. <laughs> we give up our dreams. We give up what we want for our lives. We place them on the altar of sacrifice before God and say, Lord, your will be done with my life. Here I am. Send me. I will be a living stone, an embodiment of your presence, sent out into the world to do good work and bring your presence to others. That's what God's calling you to do today. To not just sit pretty, content with just coming to church on Sunday, every other Sunday, every other other Sunday. 
but to be actively engaged in God's kingdom and bring and his mission, which is bringing his presence to the people. That's what he's calling you to do today. So why don't you all stand with me? And every head bowed, every eye closed. If you would just raise your hand, how many of you want to engage in God's kingdom? How many of you want to be living temples, not just a stationary temple, a living temple that is spreading God's presence to people? That's a lot of you. That's awesome. And keep your hands up. Another question. How many of you want, need a vision? How many of you need a vision for how God is going to do that? Because I know it's one thing to say, here I am, send me. But sometimes you need clarity. Yeah, that's a lot of you. Good. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I lift up this people to you. In person and online, I'm praying for you too. This is the church. This is your temple, a house for your presence, Lord. <laughs> you see their hearts, how they don't want to just be sitting, sitting pretty in a church on Sunday. They want to go out into the world and spread your presence, Lord. I pray you would bless them in that endeavor. Lord, I pray that you would give them vision Give them dreams. Speak to them in a new way, Lord. Bring a friend into their life to share a need for the homeless. I see someone starting a homeless ministry in this, in this church. Share your wisdom with them, your visions with them, so that they know what to do, so that we can share your presence with others, Lord. We submit ourselves to you as the church. We say your will be done, not ours. In Jesus' name. And maybe you've come today and you've never experienced the true presence of God. You've never, you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. To turn from your sins. To turn your life over to Jesus. Say, lead me. I want, to be your, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Lead my life. Is there anyone here or anyone online who would like to do that? Would you just, every, every head bowed. Would you raise your hand? Okay, yeah, I see that hand. I see that hand too. Great. Let me pray for you and the whole church repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus I, know I know I'm a sinner, but I turn from my sin. And I turn to you and ask you to be my Lord. Be my Savior, and I will follow you all the days of my life. I will be a living stone of your temple, spreading your presence to the people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you did... Except Jesus, if you did make that, say that prayer for the first time today, would you just text the word restart to 97,000? That just lets us know so that we can walk on this journey with you. Amen? All right. Thanks for listening to me go through the entire Bible. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Christian, for that great message. Um, just a reminder, we will be having uh, Together Nights tonight at 6. If you guys can um, stay and help set up for that, and we will see you guys next Sunday.